Hello folks, this is Dennis Tucker and I'm speaking to you on a cold wintry day here in uh, Kentucky. I hope that you will sit down and stay with me for the word of God. Over in Psalms 113 verse 1 through 3, it reads to us, Behold how good and how blessed it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down to the beard, the beard of Aaron. Rain down to, on the edge of his garments is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord command the blessing live forevermore. Unity is often praised, and we recognize it. We often strive to have it. And the Bible talks about unity and fellowship in together, and that is that wherever you have fellowship, there has to be this element of unity. But in order to have unity, there must be a basis for this. So there must be a basis for the fellowship. And when one is lacking, the other is also going to be lacking. If you don't have unity, you're not going to have the fellowship God intends for you to have. And so we want to look at this lesson as far as God's plan for man in the area of unity. Now, there are reasons why men are divided. There are, there are causes for division and strife. And we can list some of those. First of all, sin. Sin separates man from God. Adam and Eve, when they were in the Garden of Eden, and describes them in the first few chapters as being in fellowship with God, and even to the point that God would come to them in the cool of the evening. However, when they sinned, they were cast out of the Garden of Eden. And it's impossible to have fellowship with God and at the same time to be in sin. That, that is a constant theme throughout the Bible. Over in Isaiah 59, verse 1 through verse 2, it said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not short and that cannot save, nor his ear heavy that cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. The reason that Israel was being cast away from God was because of sin. It's not a case where God had changed, but they had moved away from God. And therefore, that sin separated them from God. And that's, again, a constant throughout the Bible. But not only does sin separate from God, but also sin caused division and strife between man. When you look at, again, uh, Adam and Eve, you find that what happened whenever God asked them the question of, what have you done in the garden of you after they have partaken of the forbidden fruit? What have you done? And what happens? Immediately, the man starts saying, well, this woman that he gave me, that she caused me to do this. You know, there automatically there is a sense of division and strife between Adam and Eve. We look and we find that Cain killed his brother Abel. And we look and say, well, that's because of sin. That sin lies the door as God reminded Cain before he had done that. It caused, sin causes David to kill Uriah the Hittite when he committed sin with uh, adultery with Bathsheba. And so it is today. Whenever you see some kind of division, some kind of strife, let's keep in mind, sin is the root cause of that, that division and strife. When we see uh, gang warfare, when we see a family members that shoot one another, when we see all kinds of evil things going on, sin is the root cause of that. And so that's one reason of sin. Another reason there is division and strife because of false worship. In the patriarchal age, in the Bible, we find that some worshiped God, and some, you know, did did not. Some did what God said, and some did not do that. Noah and Abraham, for instance, were people that worshiped God, while others turned around and worshiped idols. And therefore, there was a sense of division between those. We read later on where uh, the gods of the uh, the Amorites and the gods on the other side of the river, over in Joshua twenty four verse fifteen, it says, "I've seen evil to you to serve the Lord." Choose for yourselves this day he you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Keep in mind the land of Canaan was an area of great idolatry, but also back in Ur Chaldees was an area of great idolatry. And there and each time you find out read about these different idols. Now, that created division and strife between people because they were worshiping a different God. Now, Paul makes this point later on in the New Testament when you had Christians and you had, again, the idols of the Gentiles at that time. And 
the temples, at a place like Corinth, for instance. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, Paul said, And not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness, righteousness with lawlessness? And what's the unity between righteousness and lawlessness? What's the basis of that? There is none. And what communion has light with darkness? In this case here, uh, light usually is the idea of sin and darkness, or excuse me, light, the idea of purity and righteousness, and, and darkness would be the idea of sin. Well, what union do those two things have together? And there is none. And what accord has Christ of Belial? Or what part has to believe with the unbeliever? You know, what, what part, uh, where's the unity between Jesus and these idols, in essence, and, and between Christians and the non-believers? Where's the unity based on what can you have, how can you have unity between the two? And one agreement has a temple of God with idols. For you have a temple of living God, as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, as the point that Paul's making, therefore come out and from among them and be separate of the Lord and do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. So he's saying this is you cannot have fellowship with these idols and with these temples and go into them and think you can serve God and them at the same time. It won't happen. It cannot happen. And there are all kinds of false religions out there. You know, we look in the first century and we find the idols of that time. But, but keep in mind that today we have all kinds of different religions out there. And there tends to be this idea that, well, they're all equal. They're all the same. It doesn't really matter what you worship or how you worship. As long as you worship some, in some way, you're okay. What did Jesus say? In John 4, verse 24, Jesus said, God's spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. That we can, if we try to worship God, simply based on something else beside the truth will not work. The, the serving without our spirit involved will not work. And so we must all be worshiping in the same way, worshiping according to the truth. Jesus is not saying, now that Jesus is not saying that some Gentile that out there that was bowing down to some idol, Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman. Now, Samaritans had a knowledge of God, but their law, their understanding of God was, was misled, that, that it was wrong. And so he's saying this to a woman who understood who God was, Jehovah was, but again, their religion was wrong. Their worship was not according to the truth. And sadly today, there's a lot of people that bow down to various idols and maybe talk about their creator, about God and heaven above, but their worship is, again, not according to his will. And therefore, what we have is a division because we see today in the religious world all these different religions, all these different creed books and all these different ideas, but they're not the same. They're not the same. And, and I'll tell you the reason I know they're not the same because we have all these different denominations and they are different for a reason that you have churches in, throughout Litchfield and other places that have all these different denominational names on it, and they're not the same because they had their own creed books, they had their own ideas of how to worship God. They're not the same. And so that's one that caused the division, and that is the idea of false worship. A third one is the idea of having two different laws, and two different laws creates enmity. Now, I have to be careful here because I understand that the God dealt with the Jews under the law of Moses. And they have Mount Sinai that they had, the Jews were there and they entered this law with God. The Gentiles were not under that law. That God dealt with them through the head of the families, the patriarchal age, uh, age, we ought to say. And that age did not necessarily end right there to Mount Sinai. That God still dwelt with them. However, what happened was that both could serve the same God but this created a problem. And the problem was a distrust and rivalry between the two groups. The Jews and Gentiles tend to look down on each other. And remember the case of Jonah? When Jonah was told to go to the city of Nineveh and preach down and tell them in 40 days that city would be destroyed. And, and, Nineveh, and Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. And because he knew that God would accept them if they repented of their sins. He knew that if they actually turned away, listened to the preaching of Jonah, and, and repented, that God would spare them. And that really made Jonah upset because he did not want these Ninevites uh, actually worshiping the same God as him. He didn't like that idea. 
Now, the problem in this case was not the God's law of Moses or how he was even doing the Gentiles. The problem was man's attitude toward his fellow men. Instead of Jesus accepting the Gentiles as God dealing with the Gentiles in a separate system, and instead of the Gentiles accepting God dealing with Jews under a separate system, they looked at each other as rivals, and they had a distrust for each other. Well, that, that has been done away with, and that is there's no longer Jews and Gentiles worshiping God under two different systems. Now we are all brought together into one body and under one law. Over in Ephesians second chapter, verse 14, through verse 18, it reads, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, has broken down the middle wall of separation. Now the one made both one, it's talking about Jesus Gentiles, that middle wall of separation, what was it? That was the law of Moses. And so verse 15 says, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commands containing ordinances, so as to create himself one new man from two, thus making peace. That like God did away with the law of Moses. We're no longer under the law of Moses. No part of the law of Moses applies today. It's all the law of Christ. And so he says in verse 16, they might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, that we all are reconciled in through the law of Christ, through the death of Jesus and then verse 17, he came and preached peace to you who are far off and those who are near. Afar off refers to the Gentiles. The near were talking about the Jews who are already close to God. But he said, well, he made peace between us two. Verse 18, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. That we have the same God, we have the same law, that we are all united in serving God as long as we do what God says. And so, but this idea of two different laws created enmity between men. And just like today, when you look at the Muslim religion, you look at other type of religions out there, they have their own separate law, and they're not united. They're not, uh, the, the, there's not unity between Christianity and Muslim or Christianity and Judaism. Okay, there, there's not a unity between those two. And, but we look at, okay, what's God's plan for unity then? How does God intend for us to have unity? That unity is desired by God, first of all, and we see this in the prayer of Jesus. God's not saying, okay, I want, you know, you can be divided, you can have your own system, it's okay, don't worry about it. Jesus is a prayer. Prays for unity among his followers. In John 17, verse 20, starting there, he says, I do not pray with these alone, but also with those who will believe in me through the word that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, so honestly in reading this prayer, we understand Jesus saying that he wanted the unity and describes the unity there as what kind of unity? The same kind of unity that Jesus had with his Father. How, how united were they? How close were they? And we say they were united. There was no division between those two. And so Jesus prayed for that unity. And Jesus came so as to reconcile man to God, to bring us into this relationship with God. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now, all things are our God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, reconciliation means to bring together. It means to bring together in the right way. And it goes on and says, that is that God has in Christ reconciled the world to himself, not in putting the trespasses to them, has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ, as through, though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. When I think about reconciliation, I think about a bank statement where you have your, maybe your checkbook, and you look at the statement from the bank, and they're different. And you have to realize that the problem, and you work on it so to bring those two numbers together. Now, what he's saying is God's number is not wrong, but we have to be reconciled to God. And that's made available through Christ. But you see, the way you're reconciled to God and the way that I'm reconciled to God is the same way. And that is through Christ. And that's why he stressed so much in this passage, the ministry of reconciliation. Now, yet it fails when God's left out of the picture. 
A lot of times today, people talk and preach about unity and desire to have unity, but then they, they don't look to God for the unity. May we have some kind of convention, or may we have some kind of meeting where we're going to decide, okay, let's be united on this. And maybe, and kind of just illustrates, for instance, I may say, you know, let's be united on this, that the best color is yellow. Okay, the best color is yellow. And uh, all the women need to wear yellow dresses on the first Sunday of the month. Now, now honestly, somebody may turn around and say, I don't think that's true. I, I think the best color is actually red. And they need to wear that on the first Sunday. Or maybe the best color is blue. Or maybe, the, you know, what's the best way of worshiping God? And, and, and somebody says, I think the best worship of God is, and they talk about what they like. And the next person may say, I believe worshiping God should be done the way I like. And what we see is that when we go by what we want and we leave God out of the picture, we're not asking God to these questions. We're, we're asking ourselves. When we leave God out of the picture, see, we're going to have division. And we see religious division in the world today. And even among those who say, we see this in the world religions, and the idea of, of again, the Muslim religion and, and all the other type of world religions out there, we even see this in Christianity, where we have all these different folks that are saying, we're following Christ, but then they leave Christ out of the picture. The, yeah, they, they believe in Jesus being Son of God, but they actually leave him out of the picture. And the, and the reason led to religious division is because Instead of listening to God, they're listening to, to what they want. They listen to men instead of God. And, and John is writing First John, first chapter. And verse 3 says, That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and true in our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Our fellowship must be based upon accepting who Jesus is, and must be understanding who God is, and must be willing to do what God said to do. And so that gets us to the second thing, and that is, okay, we see the importance of unity and how it's prayed for by Jesus in his prayer in John 17, but also it says we must speak the same thing. Okay, now in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, we find that being talked about in the sense that, that we all have the mind of Christ, we all be speaking the same thing. Now this means, again, for us to do that, we have to recognize the Word of God as our standard of authority. Again, what happens a lot of times today is that people say, yeah, I'm a Christian, and, and we're going to recognize Jesus, and we're going to speak the same thing, but then they turn around, and they don't have the same authority. They don't recognize the Bible as a standard. Again, denominationalism. They will say, and, and often point out in their creed book someplace, that, they're, that they believe the Bible is the Word of God, and they will say that they believe Everything the Bible says, but then they have a creed book, and they'll say something to the effect of, here's what we think. Here's what we're going to do. So they give lip service to the Bible, but then they're really not going to let it be their standard authority. And, and, and the problem, again, is we have all these different doctrines, all these different teachings, and they're not united. They're not the same. And so what would happen? So it's kind of being hypothetical here, and I remember preaching many years ago, kind of making this point. It always stuck with me. But what would happen if you and I would decide that we're going to throw away all the creed books and we're just going to have the Bible? Okay, we're just going to study the Bible. We're going to, we're, that's, that's going to be our creed book. The Bible is going to be our standard authority. And we're going to do what 1 Peter 4 verse 11 says. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as the, with the ability which God supplies that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so what if we say, okay, you know what? If the Bible doesn't say, if the Bible doesn't teach it, we're not going to do it. And we're going to be confounded by what the Bible teaches. Not what you think, not what I think, but what the Bible says. What would be wrong with that? Okay, you know, just think about that. Is there anything wrong going on by the Bible? In fact, we are told, and, and Paul at the church of Corinth really urged them to stay within the word of God. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. He said, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Paul's for your sakes. They may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in behalf of one another. That, that, do not go beyond what is written. What's he referring to? He's referring to the word of God. 
but not add to it, not take away from it. Now, how many doctrines, how many different teachings did Jesus leave us? Ephesians 4, verse 5 says there's one faith. That means he left us one doctrine, one standard of authority. And as long as we allow that to be our standard, you and I, then we can have you know, we can speak the same thing. And, and also, also, as long as we allow Jesus to be head of this body, the kingdom of, the king of his kingdom, we have unity. After the Bible says that Jesus is the head of the body, in Colossians 1 verse 18, it says that he is the head of the body of the church, he is the firstborn of, uh, the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that all things may have the preeminence, that he is the head of his body, now, how many bodies does he have? He has one. There's one body in Ephesians 4. And if you think about that, how many heads can his church have then? How many heads does anybody have? It's one. And he is the head. As long as we allow him to be the head, he is, as 1 Peter, excuse me, 1 Timothy 6, verse 15 says, he is the only king and potentate of his kingdom. Now, the, the church refers to his people that saved. The kingdom refers to those that are under the power and authority of Christ. And so how many kingdoms did Christ establish? How many, how many churches did Christ establish? The church and the kingdom are used, sometimes they're interchangeably. There's a little distinction been made between those. The church referring to those who are saved, and the kingdom referring to power and authority of Christ, but they're connected. And so if there's one body, then there's one kingdom. And there's one kingdom, then there's one body. There's one church, which is his body, as we just read in Colossians 1, verse 18. In Colossians 1, verse 13, and it says, He has delivered us of power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. You see, we are inside the kingdom of Christ, and therefore we have that one Redemption through his, through his body. And so we need to allow him to be the head of his church. We need to allow him to be the authority of the kingdom. That'll create unity. And also, if we decide as Christians, we're going to work together inside the body of Christ. And there's a lot of Christians. You may say, okay, we understand that Christ is the head of the church. We understand that his word is our authority and that he has all power and authority. And that we also be speaking the same thing. We should be desiring the unity. But, you know, sometimes, again, there are problems inside a church, the church. And, and the, the idea of body is used to show the unity and importance of each member. And, and, and just as the, the church Corinth, when you read about them in 1 Corinthians 12 chapter. The, the church Corinth had all kinds of division and strife. They, they, they just weren't getting along with one another at all. And as Paul reminds them, it makes this comparison between that body and the physical body. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 25, it says, There should be no schism in the body, but the members should have the same care for one another. Now, you think about our physical body. We have all these different organs. I don't know. I don't have any idea how many different organs are inside our body. But I do know that we have these different organs, and each one of those is doing something that is fundamentally essential to my body. If one part of my body is having a problem, the rest of the body suffers. When all the members of my body work together, you know what? Then my body is healthy. If I get sick, and I, I work out a lot of times in the mornings to do some exercises, and if my body is healthy, then I can do those exercises, I can sweat, and I can overcome the exercises and survive and go on the rest of the day. But if I have part of my body is hurting, maybe if I have a hurt foot, then I just don't, can't do the same things. If I have a cold and my lungs are burning, then I can't do the same things. All these parts have to work together to have a healthy body. And he's making that point as far as the spiritual body. Now, in Church Corinth, the problem specifically if there was that they had these spiritual gifts, these miraculous spiritual gifts, prophecy, interpretation of, of, of tongues, speaking of tongues, interpretation, healings, those kind of things there. And, and the problem was uh, that they had some people who were comparing their spiritual gifts to somebody else and saying, I'm more important. Now, I'm the one that's more important. I'm more important than you. 
and, and, and therefore I, I should have the more preeminence of the body. And Paul's saying here that when he, he just points out something, now the brethren, these spiritual gifts all come from God. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4, God gave them to you. You didn't earn these gifts. That, that's not a case where you deserve these gifts. God gave these gifts to you. And he said that they're not rivals. You're not competing one against another. My lungs do not compete against my heart. My foot does not compete against my hand. All these members are to be working together to help have a healthy body. And therefore, when we do that, then the body is healthy and it's edified and growing and able to do a lot more good things. And so he said, that's the way it is with the spiritual body. When all the parts of the body work together, the body does can work and do its function as it should do. So what if every Christian did this in the church? Uh, what if every Christian used whatever counsel they had, whatever, and it may be different, as there were different spiritual gifts, and why very Christian use their particular gift or gifts in order to help the body grow? Well, we all studied our Bibles for the answer of God and then did our best to work together. And we put our think souls and our purposes to the side and we are doing to do what the Bible says. We're going to do what God said to do. The body's going to grow. The body's going to be healthy. And the final thing to have unity is we have loved one another as Christ loved us. We see the love of Jesus for us when we read about his death on the cross. Jesus, John 15, verse 13 says, Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. To sacrifice yourself for others is a great sacrifice. The best you can do, the most you can do. And that's what Jesus did for us. And Paul makes a point in Romans 5, verse 8, they did this, that God sent Jesus to die for us even while we were sinners, even while we were the enemies of God. Now, that shows you how much God loves us and how much Jesus loves us. And we're told to love one another. We're told to do this. Now, you can tell when people really care about one another. You can tell when people really love one another by how they treat one another, by how they talk to one another, by how they sympathize with one another, by how they pray for one another, by how they rejoice with one another, how they talk to one another. You know, those things show us how much we love one another. And therefore, if we have that love, then again, there will be unity among the Christians because based on the right things. And, and, and as we do that, then we're going to grow stronger. We're going to grow up. We're going to grow with one another. And Ephesians 4 verse 15 says, But speaking the truth and love may grow up in all things into him who is the head of Christ, for whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does this share, notice the last part, causes growth of the body for the edifying self and love. This morning, as I was working out, I was in this uh, kind of a, a kind of weights and also has some cardio workout. And there was a point there where the instructor made this point that uh, basically, you know, when our body's shaking, when we strive, and keep on going in when it hurts, that's when we're growing, that's when we're doing more. If we had that same mentality, we're going to keep on striving to work together. We're going to keep on no matter what. And, and we're going to work together based on, again, on the unity of God's word, that Jesus is the head of the church, that we have loved one another, that we are all part of the same body, we're going to work together. Then what happens is the body grows stronger. Unity is God-based, not man-based. Is the point here. When man obeys God, he is united not only with God, but also with all the other children of God. You see, if I get closer to God, if I'm worshiping the same God and you're worshiping the same God, then we're going to be naturally drawn together. And that will be happening when we allow God to be God, when we obey his word, when we speak the same thing, when we let Christ be the head of his body, the king of his kingdom, and we'll work together with love. That's when you have unity. That's what we need to have. That's what God's plan is. And always been for men to have unity based upon serving him. And so if there's division and strife, we need to look and say, why? What are we missing? What are we leaving out? And then we have to work on it. Because God wants us to be united in serving him. I appreciate you watching. And I didn't introduce myself. I'm Dennis Tucker. And I preach a lot like Road Church Christ in Lynchville, Kentucky. If you can't come and be with us on Sunday mornings at 9.30, we have Bible class at 10.25 worship. 
And then at 5 p.m. on Sunday, we have worship begin. On Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., we have Bible classes. If you have any questions, comments, let me know. Be glad to entertain those, to answer them. Maybe have a lesson on those. And if you want to study it privately, I'd be glad to do that. And also, just uh, I hope everybody's being safe, being healthy, that we've had uh, some bouts with uh, COVID here. Our daughter has had uh, the third time now she has had COVID. Uh, she's had it once every year since this whole thing has started. And Regina and I have been having to isolate this week here. Uh, but we're doing okay. Uh, we're hoping everybody else is doing go okay also. And we uh, feel free to hit the like button on this video and share it. I hope to hear from you and be able to study with you again in the future. Thank you for watching.